Today we are at the Thurgood Marshall U.S. Courthouse where we are honoring all the African American judges here in New York. And the great thing about it is we had an opportunity to be able to say thank you and start developing a pipeline so we could have more folks of color who can rise and elevate to the uh, position of being uh, judges themselves. Good evening. For the record, Robert Reed, you owe me. <laughs> However, um, there's a saying in the South, you must be ye also ready, because you never know upon which you will be called to step into the shoes of a colleague, a friend, a family member, or anything. So I am honored that I call him my mentee. I'm so proud of Jason. I first met Jason formally, first of all, we're Sag Harbor folks, but I first met Jason as a grown-up when he was appointed to Community Board 10 after I was chairperson of Community Board 10, and he excelled in his position there. And we are so proud of the work that he did for the village of Harlem in his work at the Attorney General's office and also in Community Board 10. So let's give this young man a hand. There's a saying that people plan and God laughs. I think about that as I think about my circuitous route to the judiciary. I never thought I would be standing here, but others thought. I'm looking in front, I'm standing in front of people who have known my family, who I have known for most of my life. I never thought I would be called their colleague. I never thought I would have one of them swear me in as a civil court judge. I never thought I would be able to go to them for questions, with questions regarding complex legal issues. My path to the judiciary was not very easy, and it wasn't very, I'm using this word, straight. I'm a graduate of New England College in Henniker, New Hampshire, and Arundel, Sussex, England. It was, it's a very, very small liberal arts college. We were able to go back and forth between England and the United States to gain our degree. It was a very interesting experience, though, because I came from New York, where we were all diverse. I get to New Hampshire, and they wanted to touch my hair. <laughs> I was asked, I was asked on the first parent's day by my next door neighbor, I must be so proud of myself that my parents are coming up here on the bus. Now, they didn't know Frank and Ophelia Perry, who always traveled with a case of Verve Clicquot in the back of their Jaguar. I finished New England College as president of my class and the only black person in the graduating class of 1983. I didn't know what to do. I wanted to get a master's in international administration, but I was told by my supervisor and colleagues, they were like, no, do you want to make $20,000 a year working out of podunk somewhere? You want to do something better with your life. So my advisor said, why don't you go to law school? You talk a lot. So I applied to every law school in Washington, D.C., because I felt if I wanted to be a lawyer, I should be where laws are made. I was accepted to the universities, but I chose George Washington University. I don't know why, but maybe it was because they gave me a full ride. <laughs> Perhaps that was a component of my decision. I went to GW and I was happy to be on one of their journals and involved in our student government. And while I was there, I had the opportunity to work on the Hill for the retired Congressman Adolphus Towns from Brooklyn. I worked with him for three years as his legal legislative correspondent. And I have to tell you, if you ever wanted to work for a more supportive individual, you had to work for Ed Towns. Because my colleague in his office is Leah Daughtry. Leah Daughtry is the former president of the Democratic National Association, Democratic National Committee, and she's also an ordained pastor, and she's moving the DNC ahead. So I worked with Leah, and then I left law school and got, to, got a job at a big law firm here in the city, 1986. Wilson, Elser, Moskowitz, Edelman, and Dicker. I did medical malpractice defense work. And there were very few of us of color there. So whenever there was a, um, a case in an outer borough where there was a person of color, we represented the doctors and hospitals. So if there was a person of color who was a plaintiff, Frank, you got to go and pick a jury in the Bronx for a brain damaged baby case. I was like, what? Read the file on the Ford train up to Yankee Stadium and you'll get the gist of it. 
It was good, though, because it taught me how to think on my feet, because I knew I was representing more than my firm. I was representing the people who had pushed and prayed for me to get to that position. I'm looking at some of you now, Latia and Waveney, that we met many, many years ago with the Judicial Friends. And so I decided after a while, I didn't like litigating that much. I really didn't, I, the pressure was too much. So I had the opportunity of arguing a case before the Honorable William Davis. His court attorney was Waveney Toussaint. And at the time, Waveney said to me, you know, there's going to be an opening in the appellate term first department because Sandy Granham is leaving to work in the Court of Appeals. So Waveney told me to call um, Judge Davis. Judge Davis says, I have to replace one of us with one of us because if we don't do that, you're never going to get here. So I went to work for the appellate term first department for 10 years. I thoroughly enjoyed working in the appellate term. However then, as I said, people plan and God laughs. One morning, asleep in my bed, I hear my voice called. I get up going, who's calling me? And I knew exactly what it was. The voice said, you have got to do more. Stop, stop avoiding what you've got to do. I knew what it was, and I said, that's God calling me. So the next day, I went to the chief judge, Judge Parnas, because I told God, if people think this is stupid, I'm not going to do it. So I go to the chief judge, and I said, you know, judge, I think I want to take a sabbatical and go to seminary. That's a great idea. I went to some of the other judges. That's a great idea. So then I went up to God. I said, I'm only going to apply to one seminary, and if I don't get into that seminary on a full ride, I am not going because I cannot afford to do it. So I applied to Union Theological Seminary at Columbia University, and what do you know, I got in and I got a full ride for three years. So as I'm working through that to get my Master's of Divinity and becoming an ordained pastor, of which I am, I was thinking, how is this all going to coalesce being a lawyer and being a pastor? I didn't understand that I worked as a church evangelist before I came back to the court system, traveling around and preaching, and this is something else you ought to know. Never give a preacher a microphone. <laughs> so, after getting my Master's of Divinity and becoming ordained, my daughter had been born. And as my mother says, jack leg preachers don't earn a lot of money. So my friend Peter Moulton had just been elected to civil court, and he said, Frankie, why don't you come and be my court attorney? I said, I can't do that. He said, yes, you can. Come on. So I went to work for Peter across the street. And Peter said, you know, you can do this job. I said, no, I can't. Who's going to listen to me? But the man was bright. This is one, one thing I, I want to impart to you. Make sure you listen to those who want to give you the advice that you need. Because I said no, and sly Peter would do things like this to me. You know, I'm writing a decision. Why don't you go downstairs and conference with the lawyers? Why don't you go downstairs and handle this, this, this issue? Have them argue the motion in front of you. So a couple years later, he said, you should put your application in. I said, I can't do this. He said, you've been doing it for two years. And everybody knows you've been doing it. I put my papers in the first time. I did not come out of the panel. And that's a very, it's a very interesting federal court and getting elected to Supreme and civil and being appointed by the mayor. There are three different, many different routes to get there. But I decided to go the elected route. So I put into the panel, I didn't come out my first year. I was devastated. But then my father told me, when you lose something that you want and you still want to get it, people watch you more closely when you lose to see how you react to the news, how you carry yourself. So being a person that didn't want to disappoint his daddy, I said, I'm going to do it again. I went into the panel. I came out of the panel. And then I got the support of a district here in Manhattan. And then the next thing I know, Judge Hall is swearing me in as a just judge of the Supreme Civil Court. And I'm thinking, how am I going to do this? What, you know, what am I going to do? Who's going to listen to me? And I realized at that point that everything that had happened to me made sense from going to the college to being the only black person there to becoming a pastor to working at the appellate term and now that it just made sense and I was thankful. 
But then, of course, not being satisfied, someone said, why don't you run for Supreme? And I said, no, I'm, I'm not sure I can. And then I sought the advice of some people. And you got to be careful whom you listen to. Because I sought the advice of this one particular person who was deceased, and she says, you shouldn't run. I respected this person. You should not run. And if you run, you should change your address, get an apartment where your mail can go. Because this person said that New York County wasn't ready to elect an openly gay black man. And I said, well, wait a minute. I have two children and a partner. I'm not going to start out my judicial career on a lie. Everybody knows who I am. If you don't like it, I'm sorry, but I'm still the one in the road. So I decided to press on, and I was able to come out of the Supreme Court panel. And, a year and a, two years ago, I was sworn in as the first openly gay black judge ever elected in the state of New York. People plan. God laughs. Who thought that I would be standing here in this august room with all of, all of you who bring so much to the bench and bring so much to our legal lives? I am grateful to you. I ask, though, LaShawn was like, I want to say amen, but I'm asking you for the prayers of all of you for us because it's not easy doing what we do. So we need your constant good thoughts, your good energy, and your prayers so that we can continue to bring ourselves to best represent you. God bless you.